Is there a difference with the levels of happiness and races? Yeah, I've done a lot of work on that, actually. The Baptist Church, for example, that a lot of African Americans belong to, is all about community. I mean, I don't want to say it's not about religion, but it's as much about community and empathy. For a while, we had this very strong difference in hope for the future, Hispanics versus whites, with blacks and Hispanic much more hopeful. And that's still pretty much the case. I think it's very hard for young people. So we're seeing also a lot of unhappiness among the young in the United States, also Canada and Australia. So we're not completely alone. We're the, we're the, you know, always a little more extreme than everybody else, particularly for bad things. You've written the book called Happiness Around the World, The Paradox of Happy Peasants and Miserable Billionaires. And you give a special mention to, obviously, Peru and Russia, but also Afghanistan. What's, what's special about Afghanistan? What made you... The study we did in Afghanistan was in 2012. So Afghanistan is, as you know, a very poor and tortured place, but it is really tortured now. I mean, it's, since the Taliban has taken over, it's. I, I don't think it would be, we would find the same thing anymore. But what happened in Afghanistan in our study was we found that at least in terms of contentment, that sort of experience-based happiness, positive mood element of happiness, People in Afghanistan smiled as often as people in Cuba, which is a, you know, generally Latin American culture kind of place. Um, and we were really surprised by that because it's still a country that has experienced so much over so long. So some of that has to do with, you know, be, being used to a lot of bad stuff, adapting. Wow. Yeah, I think it really goes to show how frustration really comes from our exaggeration of the importance of our desires. You know, one thing that people in a third world country have, and I don't want to sound like a spoiled um, white woman complaining about her eating disorder while there's people dying of hunger, you know, but they have a privilege of not being in their head, you know, during the war. We don't really hear about any suicide during the war because you're in your body, which is a privilege, you know, as you fulfill your physical needs, you have emotional self actualizing needs, and you have a less articulate map for satisfying those which bring uncertainty. Yeah, and you're, you're, there's a you're happy, you're happy to be able to you feel privileged to just be able to meet your needs, right? Because there's so many other people who are losing their lives or whatever. And, and there's nothing that can bring you more to your body than hunger. Maybe martial arts in first world countries, but most of our problems um, in the first world come from our innate need to expand limitlessly. So as you fulfill your uh, physical needs, you need to take a step further now. Now it's psychological needs, and now the map gets kind of blurry. You don't really know what you're doing anymore. Because if I'm hungry, I need to fulfill my need for hunger. I know what to do. I need to get food. So it's like a, it's, it is a level of certainty. We're chasing things, bigger houses, better this, better that, you know, and it's, um, there's a wonderful country music song that is called happiness doesn't live in bigger houses. And it's exactly that people chase, you know, it's the keeping up with the Joneses effect. It, it, we call it in the U S you want to, if your neighbors have a bigger house, you have to have a bigger house. So you spend all this money building the bigger house, and the, there's ah, there's no benefit to it, right? Once you're in your bigger house, it's still you. I mean, obviously, a lot of it has to do with social media. Yeah, well, social media exacerbates. I think social media gets too much blame. I think, yes, young kids are not prepared for it. And I totally agree with you. It's got all kinds of negative effects. But it's a little bit like COVID not being responsible for every mental health problem we've ever had, which the tendency is to say, all oh, this came with COVID. And it actually didn't all come with COVID. There was a lot of adaptation and the kind of behaviors or emotions that you talked about as when you're in a war, people who were doing okay during COVID felt pretty lucky about it, right? It was the same idea. Um, so, but social media has this magnifying effect. So clearly there were other things, and there still are other things going on that we don't fully know about. Um, I have an article coming out on it on the Brookings website probably next week. I'll send you that when it comes out. But it's, it's kind of saying, yes, social media matters, but there was a deeper underlying cause to this that we haven't figured out. And some of the things we talked about, this kind of need to always have more, 
in part, it came out of trying to understand the deaths of despair, which were initially much more concentrated in the white working class, essentially. It was a cohort of people who had privileged access to the, you know, manufacturing, coal mining jobs, you know, blue collar jobs, but good blue collar jobs, stable jobs, you know, with access to a union, decent pay, stability. And minorities were traditionally discriminated against. But what I know from growing up in Latin America and being around Latin Americans is that there's the close knit sort of ties between people are very informal ties and they serve as, sa as psychological safety nets, right? Everybody's your aunt or uncle in Latin America, even if you're not related to them. And so if you fall behind, you have somebody you can fall back on. And African Americans have very similar kind of close knit informal ties. When this stoic, hard work, individualistic white working class in the United States lost their jobs. They didn't have a, a narrative to fall back on, right? It had been, if you're, it was like the American dream biting them in the butt. It was like, you know, you work hard, you get ahead. If you fall behind, you're a loser. Well, all of a sudden they were the losers. And, uh, you know, you talked about not having a narrative. They didn't have an identity anymore. And minorities, in contrast, also lost jobs during the same period. They also have had hard knocks for a lot more of their lives. Um, but minorities had much better coping mechanisms. They were much better multitaskers because they'd always had to be to make it work. And so interestingly enough, now you have this bifurcation where it's minorities, at least at the lower income levels. Minorities in the U.S. are much more likely to believe, for example, in the value of higher education. And low-income whites think it's a waste of time. Part of that's because of the cost. Part of that's because of the new lovely anti-science um, uh, rhetoric of the right and Trump and his cronies. But um, but part of it is it was never, for minorities, it was always driven into people that if they, education was the only way to get ahead. It was what people couldn't take away from them with discrimination versus white working class had a trajectory of finishing high school and having, you know, pretty privileged access to blue collar jobs.